Welcome, welcome to another evening of Garlic and Ghosts. Um, it's a lovely setting here at the Garlic Farm restaurant and I'm looking forward to a lovely meal. We're then going to gently walk across the fields if I don't lose my way. If I do, we end up in some cow field. Uh, but we hopefully end up at the Night and Gorges site uh, where the gate posts are the only things that are left of what was the oldest the finest and largest of all the manor houses. Its history is fascinating and I shall talk a little bit about its history now, uh, then we shall stop and have our first course and then I will get up and uh, complete the history. Hugh de Morville was the first owner of Knighton Gorges. He was one of those that murdered Thomas a Becket. He fled to the island uh, against any repercussions about his deeds that he had done. And after he died, it then fell into his son's hand, John de Morville. And then through marriage to his son-in-law, Ralph de Gorges. Now these de Gorges were mystical Knights Templars. This very strange order of knights. And Ralph de Gorges I goes out to earn money, as they did in those days, by fighting in the Holy Wars in Palestine. And in 1270, off he goes on crusade with Prince Edward to Palestine. Well, he doesn't fare too well. He comes back and he hasn't made his fortune. Uh, he's now old, worn out, tired, and as he lies on his deathbed, his son, who is imaginatively named Ralph de Gorges II <laughs> is called over by father and father whispers something in his son's ear and then dies. The son, having buried his father, pops off to Palestine and he comes back fabulously rich. What is it that his father has whispered into his ear? I'd like to know. Because he has got wealth enough to improve the manor house, enlarge the manor house, and uh, I'm afraid he's a bit extravagant, and he blows it. He blows all the money, and now, of course, he's got to raise some more money. So, he goes out to fight the French in Gascony, and he dies there in 1294. But between Ralph de Gorges II and his son, who is imaginatively named... Ralph de Gorges III, <laughs> they have now built the Room of Tears within the manor. This room is cloaked in secrecy. It is always kept locked. The servants gossip and rumour about what is going on in there. They hear clanking chains, screams, thumps, bumps, crashes. What on earth is going on? Uh, the rumours are that human sacrifice and black magic uh, are some of the things that are going on in this room. We will never know, of course. Uh, but um, Ralph de Gorges III now has a coat of arms, uh, the de Gorges coat of arms, which is a blue spiral on a gold background. Probably means very little to you and I, but very significant to Knights Templars. Uh, in the end, Ralph de Gorges III, he pops off and um, Sir Ralph left one daughter, Eleanor. Now she marries Sir Theobald Russell of Yavaland. And he goes off to fight for the French in groves around Nunwell House. And he uh, is mortally wounded and brought back to the Room of Tears. Now by now the Room of Tears has a wooden picture, large wooden picture, hanging in it of a Turk with his turban and a scimitar, the big sword that the Turks used in his hands. This picture, we do know, is still in existence somewhere on the island. The last, it was tracked down to a Mr Riddick, who was an antique dealer, um, in Sandown. Uh, but we now have lost where that picture lies. But that hung in the room. So, uh, Lady de Gorges uh, brings back her 
husband who is mortally wounded, lays him on a bed with the picture of the Turk above his head, and there he dies under the picture. Now, for a week or more, she leaves him there lying in state while people pay their respects. Afterwards, she takes him, buries him, comes straight back to Night and Gorges, lies on the bed and dies. How odd. How very, very odd. Now the room starts to have sweet music emanating from it. And uh, again the rumours abound that the room has a poltergeist or a troubled spirit within it. Bangs and crashes are heard when they open up the room, the picture is all askew, the furniture is being thrown across the room. It causes much trouble. And in 15 and 65, the descendants of Russell sold the mansion to Anthony Dillington from Dorset. And he is fascinated with this room of tears and puts a wooden carving over the doorway saying, Room of Tears. The Dillingtons were noted for their beauty, their extravagance and their wild blood. They were aristocratic and as nutty as fruitcakes. <laughs> so Robert Dillington uh, is troubled by the activity within the room and he calls in a priest from Braiding to give an exorcism and that is recorded, officially recorded at the time. But we move on in time, and in 1721, Sir Tristram Dillington is safely enjoying his life there. Now, Sir Tristram Dillington is um, a very uh, strong character. He's a compulsive gambler. Uh, he has to have everything bigger and better than everybody else. At the time, the wealthy on the island would have a fine carriage drawn by four horses. Tristram Dillington had to have a fine carriage drawn by eight horses. He instructed the coachman to drive this coach through those gateposts at breakneck speed. And of course, people over the centuries have encountered the carriage crashing through those gateposts, the crack of the whip of the coachman as he drives them through. So Tristram also has a stallion called Thunderbolt. This thing is almost impossible to control and he charges round the house on Thunderbolt. Um, well, there is a story uh, that he has a wife and five children. And four of these children and his wife are claimed by an epidemic, leaving only one daughter, Judith. And there is said to be a portrait of Judith, again, somewhere on the island. And she is said to be uh, a very pretty-looking girl. So Tristram had his townhouse. For in those days, living in a mansion in the countryside of the Isle of Wight, um, I'm going to tell you something now that you won't believe me, but in those days the roads were in an even worse condition than they are. <laughs> you see, I knew you wouldn't believe me. So they bought, they had plenty of money, they bought a townhouse uh, where they could live in during the winter months. Now the townhouse for the Dillingtons was Seal House in Newport, right at the end of the quay there. It's now the home of our MP, uh, Andrew Turner. And I'm going to make no cheap jibes about expenses. Um, one winter's night, Dillington is there and there gambling his money away. He was a poor gambler. He lost his money, he lost his jewellery. It's late at night, they get up to go. No, as a usual compulsive gambler, I, my luck will change. Well, you've got nothing to gamble with, they said. Oh, yes, I have. I'll gamble on Seal House on the turn of that card. It was said he turned the card, lost the bet, and lost the house with it. He then saddled up. Thunderbolt, and in a black mood, having now lost not only his wife, his children, but his house, he rode through the darkness of the night at breakneck speed back to Night and Gorges, where he hurled himself in the lake and committed suicide. 
his retaining steward, it is said, saw what he had done, pulled him out of the lake, knowing that if it was proven uh, that suicide was the case, then the estate would be forfeit to the crown. Protecting his own job, he hid, it is said, the suicide by claiming there was a horse riding accident. Sending Thunderbolt into the night, cutting its girth, knowing that somebody would bring the horse back saying, I have found the horse but not Sir Tristram. And he would go through the motions of, oh golly gosh, here he is under a tree, there's been a tragic horse riding accident. And it is said he got away with it. But there is a big question mark over all of this. There is no evidence of any births, deaths and marriages of Dillington. There is no wife recorded, no children recorded on the register. Now that doesn't mean to say that didn't happen because in the 1700s the register is pretty erratic to say the least. But it is likely perhaps that he didn't have a wife and children. Was it suicide or was it an accident? He is buried in New Church. If it was suicide, he should not be buried there. I would love to dig up the tombstone and see if his skeleton is under the ground. I have half a chance his skeleton is not there. For not so long back, uh, in the walled garden where we shall take you tonight, um, they dug up a large human skeleton. Uh, this skeleton was quickly taken away and buried in consecrated ground. But regrettably, no tests were done on this skeleton for its age and its identity. It was just regarded as an old human skeleton. Was that the body of Sir Tristram Dillington? I don't know. What makes it even more suspicious is that after his death, his sisters Mary and Hannah inherit the house. And what do they do? They reward the retaining steward who so-called found his body with a farm in Braiding. Now, why should you award a steward a whole farm unless you're asking them to keep their mouths shut? So it's all very much a mystery. And here I shall leave my story and have my first course. And I will continue the plot after that. Thank you.